All right. So uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for uh, putting on this workshop and inviting me here. So I am, as, as some of you know, I'm not an Earth scientist. I'm a theoretical particle physicist. So uh, for me, this has been uh, very, very interesting and inspiring to learn so much about Earth science, uh, what we understand, what we don't understand about the Earth, um, and also how uh, you guys are doing uh, research and what you're thinking about to, to do in the future. Um, so I want to take you on a little bit of a trip. And, and the idea I want to talk about is the title I was given by the organizers is Looking for Dark Matter with Olivine. And, and the idea, as we will see, is to use a technique developed originally in geology to use old samples um, ge rocks of geological age, and we will see that olivine is a particular interesting class of, of minerals, to perhaps learn something about dark matter. <sighs> or maybe put in slightly the other words, the question I want to convince you to of that the answer perhaps might be yes, is can old rocks teach us something about the history of our galaxy and even what makes up the entire universe that we live in? Putting a little bit more detail into these, these questions, what I mean by old rocks is old minerals of ages of hundreds of mega years or perhaps a giga year that are taken from the right geological environment. In order for them to cheat us anything, what we'll have to do is one would have to image them with modern microscopy that can achieve nanometer scale resolution. And, and some of the questions that this might help us answer for example, about our galaxy, as it could tell us such wild things that we have no idea of how to measure them today in a good way. Or, for example, at what rate did the Milky Way form star stars hundreds of millions of years ago? Or what, could, what it could tell us about our universe is what is dark matter? Okay, so let me spend a few words on dark matter. I understand that most of you have probably heard about dark matter at some point, but maybe many of you don't really know what we mean by dark matter. So this is uh, a famous slide, the, the cosmic pie chart. This is what we think is the composition of the universe as a whole. So you see 5% of the energy budget of the universe is made up of ordinary matter. Protons, neutrons, electrons, the stuff that makes up you, me, the Earth, stars, everything that we see and that we know very well how it works. However, 27% of the energy budget of the universe is made up of some mysterious sub structure, some substance that we call dark matter. What we mean by that is some, some substance that interacts gravitationally just like ordinary matter, but otherwise we don't know what it does. We have not seen the effects of it in any other way. Okay, and then there's 70%, some component that we call dark energy. So this is some uh, very mysterious substance that is the cause for the, what we observe as the accelerated expansion of the universe. I'm not going to say any more about it. If you want to know about dark energy, come talk to me afterwards. What I'm going to focus on is dark matter. So dark matter makes up 85% of the matter budget of our universe. And, and the reason we're so convinced that this dark matter exists comes from observations of the universe at a number of different scales. So it starts from seeing the dynamics of stars in the smallest galaxies to how galaxy clusters, groups of galaxies, behave as a whole, to how what we call the large-scale structure of the universe, the cosmic web, the distribution of matter and galaxies at large scales that we can observe in the universe um, is, is distributed and is formed to something that we call the cosmic microwave background, which is light emitted 300,000 years after the beginning of the universe, 13 million years ago, that gives us a snapshot of how the universe looked 13 billion years ago, 300,000 years after it was created. So on all of these scales, the dynamics of how stuff behaves, from the dynamics of stars in the smallest galaxies to how the universe behaves as a whole, if all there is is the ordinary matter that we are made out of, it does not work. What we have to put in to explain all of these observations is dark matter. But that's the beauty. We have to put in one ingredient at some early time in the universe, something like 100,000 years or so after the universe created. This substance has to have been produced. It has to be around. But if it is around since then, something like five times more of this substance than, than the ordinary matter, 
then we can explain with this one extra ingredient all of these things, length scales from the smallest observable galaxies to the entire missing universe. So this is why we are so convinced that dark matter is real. However, we don't know what it is. Okay? Dark matter could be many things. The only thing we know about it is indirect gravitation. One of the leading candidates that particle physics have proposed, and this is because it's motivated to solve a number of other problems in physics, and I don't have time to talk about that, but it's something that we call a weakly interactive massive particle, or a WIMP. So for the purposes of what I'm going to tell you, what you need to know about these kind of particles, the only thing you need to know is these would be particles, fundamental particles, that have a mass roughly comparable to that of ordinary atomic nuclei within, say, an order of magnitude or so or two. And they have very feeble interactions with ordinary matter. If dark matter is made up of this stuff, then at any given time around us, here on Earth or in the surroundings of Earth, in a little size volume, there would be roughly one of these particles, and they would constantly fly around with speeds on the order of the Shikansen train, a few hundred kilometers per second. And most of them would just go, because they have these very, very feeble interactions, most of the time they would go right through us. Um, just like neutrinos can fly through the entire Earth without doing anything, these guys would go through anything without doing much. Okay? But, I said they have very feeble interactions, right? There is some interaction left. So what we do to search for these particles is something that we call the direct detection of dark matter. Okay, this is an experimental approach. What we mean by that is, thanks to these very feeble interactions, what could happen is one of these dark matter guys, again, mass roughly comparable to atomic nucleus, comes by with speeds of a few hundred kilometers per second. Um, sorry, so that's, of course, much faster than she can train. <laughs> I was thinking uh, kilometers per hour. So, so it's much faster than the concentrate, of course. It comes by with speeds of a few hundred kilometers per second. Most of the time, it would go right through Earth. But if you get lucky, this guy could hit an atomic nucleus, and the dark matter would happily fly away. The energy that's put into the atomic nucleus in, the transition, in this interaction is very small. So what would happen is that this atomic nucleus gets a tiny kick, what we call a nuclear recoil. And, and here I show you, this is classical mechanics, it's elastic collisions, you can think of it, of it like billiard balls bouncing off each other, perhaps billiard balls of slightly different size, but I'm showing you for these dark matter particles of different mass, so 5 GV is something like the mass of a light nucleus, 500 GV is something a few times heavier than, than the heaviest nuclei we know. Um, what is the recall energy that you can induce as a mass of the, as a function of the mass of this nucleus, and the only thing I want you to take away from this is this is a huge challenge, okay? So the recall energy that you would get in this is a few keV, and I don't have a good analog for what a keV is, right? In, in sort of real-world units, uh, a keV is the energy of a single X-ray photon. It's a tiny energy, okay? So what do we do to do this? Um, we build a big detector. We put a lot of, elect a lot of, a lot of nuclei in a tank, essentially, and we somehow instrument it in order to see if one of these nuclei in there gets a tiny recoil, okay? So this is, of course, a huge challenge. People have worked on this for many, many decades. How can we build these detectors bigger and bigger, suppressing all sorts of backgrounds, okay? This has been something that's been going on for decades. I could not find a, a picture of the first detector of this kind that people have built, but it was in the late 80s. They started with something like a kilogram or so of germanium, by now, this has evolved into detectors, this thing down here. Here you see this is a three-floor building next to it in an underground facility. It's an eight-ton detector filled with liquid xenon. And essentially what you do, you stare at this thing, it's very finely instrumented, over timescales of a few years, and you record a very, very small number of these few KV recalls, or you hope that that's the sensitivity that you have, so you stare at eight tons of material and you look for a very few number of, of, of uh, these events being induced of an insanely low energy, okay? So of course, why do you build these detectors larger and larger? The number of the game, the, the name of the game is for a fixed rate of interactions and we know how much of these particles are around us. The number of events you're gonna see is gonna increase with the product of how many nuclei do you have, your target mass, and how long do you observe, right? So this is something that, that we call the exposure. Now, people have been doing this for decades. However, if people would have found dark matter this way, you would have all known about it, okay? So the typical plot that we show is this. It's null results. 
What this plot shows you is from a number of different recent experiments, upper limits on, and this typical plane we used to show this is the mass of this, of this uh, dark matter candidate and the rate of interactions, the cross sections that this guy could have with ordinary matter, okay? And this has been an impressive effort. It's been going on for decades. These limits have been coming down. Remember the size of the detector. What this means is in a tank of a few tons of material, we don't see more than, at most, because of the number of backgrounds, two or three events within years. So this is insane. But still, we have not observed this, right? So what do we want to do? Of course, going into the future, one wants to extend this both to look for sort of lower mass dark matter candidates and to look for heavier dark matter candidates, okay? And there is a, a big effort, of course, on the way to build bigger and bigger of these detectors, but it is hard. You can imagine the bigger the, this detector gets, the harder it gets to do. So what we started thinking about many years ago is, is there something else we can do? And this is uh, the, the idea of how, of how some journalists tried to picture our idea. So you see, the idea has to do, of course, with rocks, which is why I'm standing here talking to you about this. So the basis behind this is something that many people in geology are quite familiar with. It is solid-state track detectors. So for many decades, since the 60s, people have seen the tracks that are formed by spontaneous fission of uranium, the fission fragments, so ions traveling through, in, in micas and other minerals, ions traveling through these crystals, and leaving a permanent damage track that you can then later, essentially however much later you want after this thing is, after these damage tracks created, you can go and you can read them out with a number of different microscopy techniques, okay? So here you see these damage tracks being produced and uh, being read out with transmission electron microscopy. The scale here is something like a micron. Here you can see after enlarging them by some chemical uh, reaction, chemical etching, you can read them out even with optical microscopy. And here you see, though, what you can do with modern technology. So these are the cross-sections of tracks. These are ions being shot at the sample, and you're looking perpendicular at the plane of the sample of where the track goes through. So you can now, with modern microscopy, you can, at the nanometer scale, you can resolve these features and see how these tracks look, okay? So, so, so one thing we can take away from this is, A, these tracks are well known, right? As ions travel through materials, they stop and they create a lasting damage track. And we can also take a little bit of a guess from these pictures of what these tracks are. So what you're seeing down here is, is a track in mica. Mica has the property that you can, if you locally, if you put a lot of energy in this, in this mineral, it melts. Uh, and then as it, as it refreezes, it doesn't refreeze into the crystalline structure, but into an amorphous core. Whereas here, what you see, a different material that does not have this, this amorphous property as you refreeze it, but here you see some chemical stress. So what these, these uh, tracks are, are some irregularities in the crystal lattice. Okay, so what is the idea of Paley detectors? The idea is dark matter could come, it could scatter off one of the atomic nuclei in a old mineral, it could kick that nucleus around, give it a small recall, as that nucleus grinds to a halt, it makes such a damage track, and you can then, then go later and read out this damage track with microscopy techniques, okay? And the magic of why this works is that once you make these tracks, they're there forever. So you could have a detector that has been recording all of this information for hundreds of millions of years. Okay? So let me step through this a little slower. So what is the idea behind paleo detectors? So one good thing is many minerals that are found in nature naturally are good solid-state track detectors. It's not there's only mica. Many minerals have this property. And the basic thing you have to fulfill in order to be a good track detector is you have to be an insulator or a poor semiconductor. In many minerals, once you make these tracks, these, these damage features are preserved for essentially arbitrarily long timescales, in particular timescales that are much, much longer than the age of any mineral that has ever been found on Earth. For example, in something like diamond, at room temperature, um, these fission tracks last for something like 10 to the 40 years. Of course, Earth, is a prolific source, as you guys know much better than me, of very old minerals, right? The oldest minerals found on Earth are something like two billion years old. And the reason why we're thinking about this now, this idea, is that modern microscopy technique at the nanometer scale has taken huge steps since, uh, since a few decades ago. 
driven by, by many interests to build uh, nanotechnology, but not least because of the chip industry, right? So chips that are nowadays manufactured are at a 10 nanometer scale. So there's a big interest both in, in manipulating structures at 10 nanometers, but also imaging the structures at 10 nanometers. Okay, so modern microscopy technology might allow to read out these tracks in relatively large samples with extremely good resolution. Okay, what do these things get you? So the age of these minerals and the fact that these tracks can survive for these, these extremely long times, uh, the benefit you get from that is, of course, that you can get an enormous exposure. Okay, if you, emit, if you imagine it, you could image 100 grams of material that has been recording these, these tracks, these defects for one giga year, you would have an exposure that's equivalent to a normal detector that you can operate if you're, if you're optimistic for, say, 10 years, that has, is a 10, 10 kiloton detector. This is orders of magnitude larger, three orders of magnitude larger than any detector anybody has ever built for, that, for dark matter. Okay, and, and this, this modern microscopy technology, if you achieve something like nanometer scale resolution, you could be sensitive to, to um, nuclear recalls with recall energies as low as a keV. Okay, now I have to tell you a little bit about backgrounds. I'm only going to tell you about the backgrounds that are relevant for selecting what kind of samples you would be interested in to do this. Okay, so of course there's other things that can cause these nuclear uh, nuclear recalls, and one particular thing is is cosmogenic backgrounds, right? So cosmic rays come all the time; they rain on and on our atmosphere. They interact with all the stuff in Earth atmosphere, and then uh, they make a cascade of secondary particles that rain down to Earth, and there could interact. With, uh, with your piece of rock, for example, and make some background tracks. The way to get around this is to take a sample from deep underground. Quite quickly, you will shield all charged cosmic rays, etc. then you're left with muons. And the most, diff the, the most uh, dangerous things that these muons do is not the muons itself, but every once in a while, a muon could interact close to your rock sample with the surroundings, cause a neutron, and then this neutron would could for, go into your rock sample and there scatter off, elastically scatter off an atomic nucleus and give a very similar signature to what uh, a dark matter induced nuclear recall would look like, essentially the same thing. So how do we deal with this? Well, as I said already, you have to shield against this, right? You have to use a sample from very deep underground. Now, we're not talking about operating some big detector, right? We just want some rock sample. So what you need to do to suppress this background flux and units that are appropriately for something that we want to do per square centimeter per giga years, you would have to pick a sample from a depth of something like five kilometers or so of rock overburden. Of course, you could substitute some of the rock overburden with uh, water overburden. Water is also a good shield for these guys, right? But you have to have a sample that comes from relatively deep underground to reduce the number of um, cosmogenic backgrounds. Okay, and, and, and one way to do this is to, for example, use bore cores, right? As we heard in this conference, and as many of you know, we know how to drill boreholes very deep down to great depth. And in principle, um, at least on land, we can drill these holes down to a depth of, of uh, five kilometers fairly easily. Below the sea, it's a little bit harder, but hopefully it will be possible soon too. And one can extract uh, bore cores from these holes. So this is a way how you could get these samples from deep underground. Something else where geology comes in is radiogenic backgrounds, right? And again, it turns out the most different, the most dangerous thing you can get from this is neutrons. Okay, so both spontaneous fission of something like uranium and thorium, etc., and, and all the products in the decay chain produce neutrons, and then there's a copious amount of alpha particles being produced in the decay chain, and then there's these rare alpha n events, alpha n interactions that I'm sure uh, some of you know about, where a, these alpha particles interact with the atomic nucleus, making neutrons. So you have all these neutrons, and then these neutrons can come scatter off the, the target nuclei in your sample and cause nuclear recalls. So how do you deal with this? Well, we have to get a sample that comes from an environment where the ambient amount of radioactivity is very low. So if you take a sample from the surface of the Earth or that is formed in the crust, the, the continental crust, then the uranium concentrations in such samples would lead to, lead to prohibitively large background values. Okay. So what you need to do is you have to have a sample from a much more radio-pure environment. So some samples, some types of minerals that we have thought about, but uh, there's some geochemists in the audience who can tell me this much better, if these are good ideas, or if there's maybe some other source of type of sample sources that we should look at, but are olivines or other examples of ultra-basic rocks, uh, where there have been samples measured with uranium concentrations low as something like uh, 0.1 parts per billion, and another source are marine evaporites, 
um, that could have uh, uranium concentrations on the level of something, uh, maybe even 10 to the minus 11 or so. I should say these have not been measured, as I, I, I guess many of you know, as far as I know, to, uh, to these low concentrations, because it is very hard to measure uranium concentrations such low. Okay, but these are um, types of minerals you could look at. Okay, so that's basically the story. What do you want? You want a mineral that is from deep underground, so it's been shielded from cosmogenics. It has to be low in radioactivity, okay, and it should be old, hundreds of millions of years old or so. Okay, finally, there's neutrinos. Neutrinos can come, they can elastically scatter off the atomic nuclei in your sample, make nuclear recalls, but there's nothing you can do. You cannot shield against neutrinos of these energies, right? So no, these neutrinos come from the sun. In principle, there's also geoneutrinos. Um, of course, and then uh, there's neutrinos from, for example, supernovae, exploding stars, massive stars, something like 10 times as heavy as our sun, um, and they make neutrinos. There's nothing you can do. You have to live with them. You calculate what, is, what does this background spectrum look like, or, as I will show you also, you can dream of using this as a signal itself. Okay, so then what would this experiment look like? In my eyes of a theorist, right, what you do is you have this, this piece of rock, you will read it out, I will show you some ideas of how you could read out these tracks, and then what you measure is a distribution of the length of tracks, the number of tracks as a function of the length they have, right? So here I'm showing you this from something like a nanometer up to a micron, and you would, in, in, um, in units of per kilogram mega year, or if you want, per gram giga year. So a sample of one gram that is a giga year, large, a giga year old would have this many tracks. So you would see at low um, uh, track lengths of something like you know, a few to tens of nanometers, what you're dominated by is this background induced by solar neutrinos. Okay? Whereas if you go to, um, to larger track lengths on the order of hundreds of nanometers to a micron, what you would be dominated by is the spectrum that comes from all these radiogenic neutrons that then scatter in your target material. But luckily, you can, you can calculate the shape that these backgrounds could have. You can also calibrate them in the lab, at least the, the radiogenic neutron background you can calibrate very easily, and you can predict, like, right, what does this look like? So you can measure it, say, out here and predict what will it then, how many backgrounds will it get somewhere else. So what you can you do with this? You can dig out a signal that would, induce by, by, would be induced by dark matter. So here I'm showing you two examples. One is a relatively light dark matter candidate of the mass of, of 5 GV, so like a light nucleus, like helium or so, and a, a much, sorry, a much heavier dark matter candidate with a mass of 500 GV. So if you want to look for these light dark matter candidates, you would have to look at something like few nanometer long tracks, whereas if you look at a heavier dark matter candidate, then you could get away with a worse ability to resolve these tracks because you only have to be able to see these sort of 100 nanometer long tracks. Okay, so how can I see tracks that are, you know, a few nanometers long, 100 nanometers long, these defects in a crystal? Okay, we don't know. I will show you also there are some people that are now trying to explore this in the lab, but some ideas of modern microscopy techniques that might be able to read out these kind of tracks in relatively large samples I will show you. So one, the first is, is uh, X-ray cartography, okay? So what you do, this is a very fancy version of X-ray microscopy. You need to go to an accelerator because what you need is a high quality beam of hard X-rays to do this, which we can produce at electron, uh, electron storage rings or free electron, free electron lasers. Um, so what you do is you then you have this high quality beam of hard X-rays, you focus it on your sample, you take a diffraction image, you then you scan that over your sample and then you do the same as what you do if you get a CT in the hospital. You rotate the sample, you repeat the procedure, and by that you can build up a three-dimensional image of what the structure looks like. And here is a picture, this is just an example of the, they've done to demonstrate uh, what this technology can do. So this is a glass colloid. They manufacture just to show what it can do. Here you see a zoom in in this region. So it's a 3D structure, and they could image it with a 3D resolution of something like 60 nanometers for a bulk sample. So this is insane what you can do with this technology, and I hope um, actually uh, there's, there's an attempt to try this already uh, later this month to image some tracks uh, using uh, first the 2D version of this. Okay, another thing you can do if you want to have better resolution. So here you see, right, I said this has something like 60 nanometer or so resolution. So you could look for these 100 nanometer long tracks or so, but seeing few nanometer long features would be hard. So another idea, something you could use is what is now commercially available, helium ion beam microscope. So the idea is what you do is you shoot a helium ion beam at your sample, you measure backscattered electrons or helium ions, and by that, 
you can achieve a resolution, so again, this is a demonstration picture, of sub-nanometer scale. So here they resolved this edge of, of the sample with 0.3 nanometers, okay? Something that I really like about this technology, it's zoomable. So here's a picture of a rodent kidney, and you see here is sort of a much bigger field of view. Here the bar is five microns, and then you can zoom in on a part of the sample that you're really interested in, and you can image this. Here you see the bar is 15 nanometers. So this is a really cool technology, and as I said, now you can buy these machines uh, for, I think, a few hundred thousand dollars, and I think there's actually two of them in Japan, and then there might be uh, tries to use one of these to, to look for tracks. Okay, what can you do with this? So I'm not going to go through this in detail, of course, um, but, so what I'm showing you here, this is the same plane for what dark, this dark matter parameter space, hypothetical particles of what I showed you before, the interaction strength versus the mass, here in gray are the currently existing limits. So here I'm showing you what you could do with this helium ion beam microscopy, imagining you could image something like 10 milligrams of samples, okay, which you might be able to do at some point in, I don't know, maybe a decade or so. Okay? So you could push down, and these different colored lines should show you the sensitivity in using different rocks that have different amounts of backgrounds, right? Um, so you could push down and be sensitive to relatively light dark matter with much lower interaction strength than we can currently measure in these type of experiments. Instead, if you use something like this X-ray uh, microscopy readout that has worse spatial resolution, so you can only see longer tracks corresponding to heavier dark matter candidates, but you can Im image much larger samples that you can do with this very, uh, with this helium ion beam techn technology. So perhaps you could image something like 100 grams of material, and then you would be sensitive to heavier dark matter candidates and push the sensitivity down in this direction. Okay. All right, so let me use a few minutes to talk about something else. What else could you do with this? You could look for neutrinos, right? Dark matter, who knows? Maybe it is made out of these wimps. Maybe it is made out of some entirely different beast. Could be black holes, could be some much lighter particles. There's many, many particle, dark matter candidates we've invented. There's neutrinos. We know neutrinos are there. They come for, well, Bill might argue with this. But uh, I believe neutrinos are there. They come from a number of astrophysical sources. And so we could try to measure the nuclear recodes induced by that. OK, what could you do with that? One thing, and this wraps back to learning something about our galaxy, is you could, re you could measure the neutrinos that are emitted by all the supernovae that have gone, on, gone off in our galaxy during the last however old year rockets, hundreds of millions of years. OK? I don't have time to go through this in details, but what I'm showing you here is a projection for what is the smallest rate of supernovae in our galaxy that you could measure with this as a function of the uranium concentration in your sample, because that will be the leading background. And here are benchmarks, these, these dashed lines for what people believe the supernova rate in our universe, in our galaxy to be, which has never been directly measured. So you see if samples with sufficiently low uranium concentrations are available, then we could get a direct measurement of the supernova, the average supernova rate in our galaxy. Okay? You could do something even cooler with that, right? Imagine you don't have one rock, but imagine you look at, say, 10 samples. And it does not matter what particular these kind of signals I'm looking, I'm showing here are. Uh, these are examples of some substructure that the dark matter distribution in our galaxy could have. But imagine you have, a sick, you have 10 of these samples. In each of these samples, you would measure the total number of signal tracks accumulated during the age of the sample, right? But imagine you now have a few of them. You can do a numerical derivative of this total number of events and get the history of the rate. You can learn, right, did this, sam sample, uh, did this signal accumulate linearly in time, or perhaps did the signal, was it injected periodically, right? At time scales of, what do I know? Maybe tens of millions of years. Or did all of the signal, was all of the signal injected at some particular time, right? So you could gain information about the history of the signal rate of something here on Earth over hundreds, time scales of perhaps hundreds of millions of years. And this is um, something we have, this is this type of information is very, very hard to get access to, right? You do something like this in geology, um, of course, but this is a technique how we could use geological techniques in principle uh, to learn something about these type of signals coming from our universe. So something you could do is you could learn what is the star formation history, the, rate, the, the, his, the history of the rate at which stars formed in our Milky Way, because the rate at which stars was is directly thought to be connected 
to the rate of these supernova explosions, right? And here, I don't have time to go through this, but I'm just showing you, you could distinguish different models for what people believe the star formation history of our universe to be. You could also learn something about cosmic rays, the rate of cosmic rays hitting Earth for hundreds of millions of mega years. Okay, let me end by showing you something that I'm very excited about. So, so far, this has been an idea that I've been playing around with and talking with many people to and working with many people on for now something like five years, but we are all just theoretical physicists, right? Eventually, somebody has to try this and show that you can do it in the lab. So there's some very exciting work, and this is also why I'm very excited to come to Japan, because some of this work is happening in Japan. So one group is led by Shigenomu Hirose at, at Jamstack, and he has been doing first studies to measure low-energy ion implants so these tracks being made by few kV, 10 kV to 100 kV ions in samples being read out with, um, uh, after chemical etching with atom force microscopy. And you see the scale here of these samples is something like 20 micron. And these little holes you see here are these damage tracks that are caused by these ions. And there's another effort led by Tatsuhiro Nako at Tohu University, and he's trying to demonstrate that you could perhaps read out these tracks with optical microscopy, again, after first enlarging the chemical etching, which might allow you to do a very large throughput. So I think I've already uh, run well over time, so I'm going to leave you with my conclusions, and I hope that I convinced you that this is a long shot, but it might be possible that some rocks that we could dig out, if it's the right kind of rock from deep below Earth, could teach us something very fundamental about the properties of our Milky Way and our whole universe. Thank you.